Good morning, everyone. Man, today is a monumental day here at New Covenant Church. And you might be asking yourself, why is today monumental? Because today is August 9th, 2020. It's the first time that we are publishing our service on YouTube and on Facebook online while simultaneously having an in-person service at 10 a.m. at 767 Lee Road in Clyde, North Carolina. What does that mean? That means two things. It means first, we are gathering back together live outdoors with social distancing, singing our songs loud and worshiping together and enjoying some fellowship with each other, while at the same time investing more technology so that our online uh, services stay at a high level and continue to get better and better. For this season, we're having to run both plays, do both things at the same time, and we want to make sure whether you're in person or watching from home that you have a great quality experience. Last week, we had a test service. Our worship team was outside on the back of a trailer, and our parking people and our ushers and greeters were here, and we went through a whole service just to learn what we needed to learn. Yes, we learned a lot, but we feel comfortable that we're prepared for this morning to take care of our folks who show up and have a great service outdoors. This launches a brand new season of seeing us coming back onto campus, and therefore, our sermon for this morning is how to launch a comeback. And I want to talk to us out of 2 Chronicles 29. And, and, and for just a moment, let me make sure I recap. You remember that, that the nation of Israel was 12 tribes. And, and after David and then Solomon, then Jeroboam and Rehoboam came on the scene, and they split the kingdom into two different kingdoms. So the two southern tribes are called the kingdom of Judah, and the ten northern tribes are the kingdom of Israel. One of the things that, that's interesting about those two kingdoms is Judah will have a good king, then a bad king, then a good king, then a bad king. But Israel, the northern kingdom, always has a bad king. And so we see a, a huge difference between the two kingdoms. In the southern kingdom of Judah, a king comes along called Ahaz. And Ahaz is not a good dude. He is not a good king. In fact, he starts making metal idols and sets them up around the kingdom for the whole kingdom to worship Baal and then institutes the practices of child sacrifice, one of the most abominable things to the Lord. And so the southern kingdom of Judah is following the lead of the, the northern kingdom of Israel that's practicing Baal. When King Ahaz dies, King Hezekiah comes upon the scene. King Hezekiah is one of the best kings of the southern tribes of Judah. And we're going to look at King Hezekiah as we read 2 Chronicles 29. And he does four things on how to launch a great comeback, how to launch a comeback. As we're coming back in the building, we want to learn from our forefathers on how to do it and do it well. So here's the passage. I'm going to read the first 14 verses. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father done. There was very few kings that ever were likened unto King David, and Hezekiah is one of them. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now notice this. In the very first month of his reign, he went ahead and one of the first things he did was begin to work on the temple, the house of the Lord. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. Because of all the idol worship, uh, uh, pagan stuff had ended up in the holy house of God. And he said, get all that filth out of the holy place that belongs to God. For our fathers have been unfaithful, have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of, of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do, do not... 
now be diligent. I'm sorry. Do not now be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to be his ministers, and to make offerings to him. Then the Levites arose. Now, I'm going to read some of these names, and I'm probably going to misspell them, but I try to always read these names. And the reason I do that is because people matter. And we're speaking about generations of people that God called. And I want, to, I, just, I want to redeem them and redeem their purpose as I read some of the names. So don't check out on me yet. Then the Levites arose, Mahath the son of Amasi, and Joel the son of Azariah, of the sons of the Kohathites, and of the sons of Moriah, Kish the son of Abdi, and Azariah the son of Jalil, and of the Gershonites, Joah the son of Zimna, and Eden the son of Joah, and the sons of Eliphan, Shimri, and Jewel, and of the sons of Asaph, Jechariah, and Mataniah, and of the sons of Heman, Zeal, Shimni, and of the sons of Zebduthun, Shimai, and Uziel. All right, we'll finish with, that, with all those names, and you'll see why I wanted to read them in a second. The first point is he consecrates the priests. King Hezekiah looks at the state of his nation and realizes that the reason his, the sons and daughters are in captivity and that, is, that Judah has fallen by the sword is because they've broken covenant with God. And his intentions are to reestablish that covenant, which will give God the right to pour out his blessing once again on his people and restore the lamb. So in the very first month, King Hezekiah comes to the Levites and says to them, it's time to clean up the house of, the God, uh, the house of God and get ready to offer burnt offerings to him. Now, we've talked about this in the past, that when, when Moses was ready to serve the Lord and he'd come down the mountain, he was ready, he had the Ten Commandments in his hands. Remember, they made the golden calf. He asked, which tribe will stand with the Lord? And the Levites stood up and said, we will stand with the Lord. Because of that, the Lord made the Levites a tribe of priests. Now, from the Levites, some served directly to the Lord in the tabernacle, and some served outside the tabernacle, serving the priest that served God. So within the Levites, you have the Levites and you have the priests. So notice in this passage that Hezekiah goes to the priest and says to them, consecrate yourself. We're getting ready to clean up the house of the Lord. We're going to start offering burnt offerings, and I intend to establish a covenant with God that will allow him to bless his people. So the first thing that we're going to have to do is he consecrates the priest. And he mentions the genealogy, and I think it's so important that he does that because God does not change his purpose. God has a way to get done what he always wanted to get done. Even if he intended for you to be a part of that plan and you don't want to do that plan, he can raise up another. But God's intention was to have a holy priesthood that were set aside, men that would serve him in the tabernacle, that were ministers to him, men that knew his heart and knew his preferences. And so the first thing Hezekiah does is go back to the priesthood, and you have to realize that the priesthood was probably not functioning under King Ahaz. He, the priesthood were probably defiled. The priesthood had probably been tainted by other worship, a worship maybe of Baal. And yet here is God saying, I have preserved a lineage. I have a tribe of people I have handpicked. I put my anointing on them, and I don't intend to do something different just because they messed it up. I'm going to stick with the genealogy. I'm going to use the Levites. I'm going to call up the priests. I'm going to take what I have and just call them to a higher level. So the genealogy of the priests has not been forgotten. God has preserved a remnant. One of the things that it comes up over and over again in Scripture is that God always preserves a remnant. He's always got 50 prophets hidden away in a, in a cave somewhere. He's always got somebody that waiting in the wing. Uh, is there not a prophet in Israel? Well, there's one guy. God's always got a remnant ready to step onto the scene when it's due season for him to do something. Sometimes it'd be easy for us to get lonely and think we're the only ones that are being obedient or diligent, or that we're long-suffering. But I promise you, God has kept a remnant ready to do his work. And when it's time, they are enough. With the Lord, they are enough. And I think about us in this COVID-19. A lot of the individual Christians have been doing really well. We've been, we've been doing a lot of Zoom meetings. We've been doing some impromptu face-to-face -face meetings, some prayer walking, some serving in our community. 
But man, I just, I can't wait for us to be able to come back together as the priests of God. See, here's the thing. The King Hezekiah had the right to declare what the next move is. We are gonna make a deal with God. But he needed the priest to be able to clean up the sanctuary so that they could go in and do the ministry to God so he could make God the offer of the covenant. So the king and the priest had to work together. Oh, the beautiful thing about the New Testament church in 2020 is you are both the king and the priest. You have the right as a king to give yourself permission as the priest to go serve God and do what he wants to do. You don't need anybody else. You alone have the right to declare over yourself as a king the right to rise up as a priest and begin to clean up the house of God and to minister to him. So I'm calling out to all kings and all priests right now that our first move is to consecrate the holy land, consecrate the, the gathering place, and consecrate our own lives to make room for God to do something miraculous. God remembers the purpose he has set forth in our lives generations ago. He has preserved a lineage of priests to lead the comeback. He doesn't change his minds. Once the priests are consecrated, the king orders them to make sin offerings and burnt offerings for the people. Now notice what happens. The king says, first saying, priest, you have to consecrate yourself. And then I want you to clean up the temple. You got to clean up the tabernacle and get it ready because that's where the presence of the Lord has chosen to live. Once you get that done, then I want you to offer sin, uh, sin offerings and burnt offerings on behalf of the people. And it's one of the most important things of the priesthood is, number one, we have to consecrate our own lives and prepare ourselves as a holy vessel. Number two, we have to clean up the house of God, the place where we're going to make the transaction, where we're going to trade with the Lord and make a deal with him about the covenant. But then also there has to be a sin offering and a burn offering on behalf of the people who aren't even aware of what's going on right now. One of the biggest um, challenges that we have in church leadership is we have to be careful not to listen too much to the world or even too much to the people because many times God woos the king and the priest to do, make a major move that the people are not even aware of what's being made. The priests have to move first to open the door for the people to see there's hope once again. If you can only imagine being godly people under King Ahaz, maybe you fall away from the Lord, maybe you backslide, maybe you hold on to your faith. And finally, a new king comes on the scene, and this king just happens in the very first month. He comes in and begins to change everything. And can you imagine if you were uh, uh, from Judah, and suddenly in Jerusalem, the priests were burning sin offerings and burnt offerings again. Can you imagine the excitement that would happen publicly as the priesthood re-engaged, as offerings were going up, as you smelled the aroma of those sin offerings, and suddenly hope would come to a nation that had been depressed, a nation that had been taken over, a nation that was being challenged on all sides. And I believe right now in this season, there are so many challenges in our world. Who could have ever have predicted we would have been in this predicament? But I'm quite confident that God is calling kings and priests together to offer sacrifices. And hope is rising in our nation right now. And it's coming through our transactions with the Lord. So engage spiritually right now. I'm not saying not engage uh, physically or politically or anything else. Don't disengage from the world. But first and foremost, we must find our place making offerings before the Lord. The first step that King Hezekiah did was he consecrated the priesthood and got them ready for a brand new day. All right, now I'm going to read a couple more verses, uh, verses 15 through 19. And it says, They gathered their brothers and consecrated themselves and went in as the king had commanded by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. The priests went in the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it and carried it out to the brook Kidron. They began to consecrate on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule of the Lord. Then for eight days, they consecrated the house of the Lord. And on the 16th day of the first month, they finished. Now pause here for a second. It says they began on the first day of the first month. And it took them eight days of cleaning up the tabernacle 
to even, uh, excuse me, the temple, to even get to the vegetable. And then it took eight more days, and it took a total of 16 days to clean all of the defilement, all of the junk, all the idol worship, all the stuff out of the house of the Lord. Do you remember what Solomon's temple looked like? Do you remember the glory falling on the temple? Do you know what that must have been like to clean up like cleaning a, a, a dirty cellar or a dirty attic, except it's the house of the Lord. It took 16 days before they were finished cleaning everything up. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings and all its utensils, and the table for the showbread and all its utensils, and all the utensils that King Ahaz discarded in his reign when he was faithless, we have made ready and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. After he consecrates the priesthood, he then cleans up the house of the Lord. He gets the house ready to experience the presence of the Lord once again. 16 days to get out all the junk. And they say as part of that, they find the utensils that had been used to offer sacrifices. They cleared out everything in front of the altar and then brought in the utensils and had them laid in front of the altar. And everything was now ready to start doing business with the Lord. Now, a couple things about that. First of all is this. We know in the New Testament that we are the house of the Lord. None of us by ourselves are the church. But we being fitted and joined together with Christ as our head, us being fitted and joined together, we form the temple of the Holy Spirit. We form, and God moved in, the Holy Spirit moved into us. And now, not just do I have Holy Spirit living inside me, but when I connect with other believers, I am forming a house where his presence can move in in a powerful way. We can then offer sacrifices for kingdoms. This, these sacrifices were not for one family. They were the, for the whole nation. They were for the peace of the nations around them. We have the ability in this season to come together in unity as the body of Christ, consecrate ourselves, cry out to God, have his presence move into our gatherings, make sacrifices that, 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 that move kingdoms, move the kingdom of heaven onto earth and destroy demonic kingdoms and bring peace to our community, to our state, to our nation, to our world. That's the kind of stuff the Lord's calling us to. I, 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 sometimes I get frustrated when we get bogged down in small church ideas when we are called to do nothing less than establish the kingdom of heaven in our environment right now and bring about the return of King Jesus. Wow! Can you believe that he picked you to be on the earth for this assignment? Can you believe that 2020 is happening right now? I was watching a documentary by Ken Burns, who is a historian. He's a movie maker, done a lot of stuff on the Confederate War, PBS, stuff like that. It was fascinating. They asked him you know, to, to tell us how 2020 has impacted America and what's its place in history. And he said, there's only three events in history that compete or that can even have any kind of correlation with what's happening in 2020 that's happened in American history. He said the Civil War, the Great Depression, and World War II. That is the only three events. Literally, those three events impacted every life, every community in this nation. And he said uh, the pandemic of 2020, the racial injustice, all we've seen in 2020 rivals that level. What an honor that the Lord would pick me and you what I like to call imperfect priest, to be on the scene right now, to be able to lean in and to be able to see supernaturally God bring his kingdom. And as his kingdom is restored on earth, bringing back the second coming of Jesus Christ, that's exciting stuff. Now, here's a couple of things that I find pretty intriguing. Number one, they pulled out all the yucky stuff. Uh, we had a prophetic word from one of our guys last week, Stephen, and he said this, he says, in this last season, I feel like the Lord has emptied me. I, I've been empty. It just feels like everything's been pulled out of me. And today, as we were doing the test service, Stephen says, he, re, he, he showed me why. He was emptying me of everything so that he could fill me fully with himself. That sometimes the Lord has to get 
fear, anxiety, depression. Sometimes the Lord has to get idolatry or trust issues, insecurities. He has to get them out of our lives, selfish ambition, the American dream. Sometimes he's got to get that all out of our life to make enough room for the size of the deposit of the glory of the Lord he wants to put inside of us. I don't want a little bit of Jesus. I want all of Jesus, every bit I can get. And so he, sometimes he's got to clean that yucky stuff out of the temple. And then he made repairs to the temple. And this is where inner healing comes in. You know, sometimes he can get the sin out of our lives, but then we got to process the shame and the disappointment and sometimes the regret of the things that we've walked through. And I was just listening to a prophetic word on the way into to church, and, and he was talking about that in God's economy, nothing's wasted. If you allow God to redeem it, something that was done 30 years ago is brand new today. Everything that's ever happened in our lives, if we turn it over to the Lord and we allow him to redeem it, it's never wasted in God's economy. But here's something really exciting I want you to see. I don't know if you saw it yet. I've been shouting all day thinking about this concept, and I hope this hits you, and I hope that you see the value of this. When the priests cleaned out the temple for 16 days, they found the holy utensils that had been used to make sacrifices years and years ago, and instead of throwing them away and making brand new ones, the Lord chose to consecrate those utensils and use them again, even though they had been defiled. There are so many Christians that discount themselves, discredit themselves, disqualify themselves because they went through a season, a bad season in their life. But I've seen over and over again that the Lord prefers to take something old and redeem it and use it again than to replace it with something new. And I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you've worked through. But if God crafted you and created you for his joy and for his purpose, don't you dare duck out of the game. Don't you dare bow out. He can take something that worked in the past, was defiled and useless for a season, but he can redeem it and enjoys watching it be used and refitted for a new season. I'm speaking a new day, a new season over your life, that you will have the grace to look at the worst stuff the devil could remind you of. The worst stuff. Take those things that he can remind you of, repent of them, lay them down, and then stand up as a utensil in the hand of the Lord and let him use you to bring great righteousness and great peace. He can take an old utensil and do a brand new work. So I ask that you trust the Lord with that. I want to read 25 through verse 30. And it says, And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David, and of Gad the king seer, and of Nathan the prophet, for the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. Pause here. I have never seen this verse. I don't know who stuck it in my Bible last night. This is incredible. We always give King David credit for recognizing and understanding even though the Levites are the only tribe that could go into the presence of the Lord and serve in the, in the tabernacle, David recognized that God wanted a people, that were all the people to be priests. So, so David's of the tribe of Judah. He's not supposed to go in the presence of the Lord. But somehow he has New Testament revelation that God is protecting his Old Testament people from being consumed by judgment by coming into his presence uh, unworthily. But David realizes that he'll never be worthy enough. But if he has a contrite heart and the right spirit, God would welcome him into his presence. And I've always given David all the credit for that. But in this verse, we got to share the credit. David surrounded himself with a prophet and with a seer. And it says that according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king seer, and of Nathan, the prophet, for the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. And that reminds me of that of the, the verse in Amos 3, 7 that says, God does not do anything on the earth except through his prophets. He tells his prophets first. And here, David positioned himself, the greatest king Israel ever had. And yet he was not too big to have a seer and have a prophet and them in community together. See, I, I, they, they discovered the New Testament revelation that God wanted them in his presence. I, I'm around a, a lot of different spiritual people, and some people prefer to be spiritual and be alone. 
But after a while, if you're a spiritual person by yourself, we only see in part, we tend to get wonky. We tend to lose the flavor and perspective of doing life and relationship with other people who are also spiritual. We were not made by, to be alone and isolated. We were made to be in community. And right here, David submits his revelation to the revelation of, of Gad, then also the revelation of Nathan. And together, they recognize the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. New Testament revelation breaks out in the Old Testament. And many of the songs we sing today come from that era where grace was bestowed upon the, the Old Testament kingdom of Judah and Israel, but prophesied to a New Testament revelation that you and I get to have every single day. All right, let me finish, keep, keep talk, reading these scriptures. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also. And the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of King David of Israel. So what's happening is the burnt offerings are being offered. Suddenly the, the, the trumpets are being blown. The instruments are being played. It's all being done at the same time. The whole assembly began to worship and the singers began to sing. And the trumpeters sounded. And all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and they worshiped. And Hezekiah, the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph, the seer. These are the Psalms. And they sang praises with gladness and they bowed down and they worshiped. Now, what's so interesting about that passage is that they, they started offering burnt offerings, but while they were doing the burnt offerings, they began to sing and they began to play instruments and they kept doing that until the burnt offering was consumed. See, sometimes we, we don't sing long enough. Sometimes we sing, but we quit before the burnt offering's been consumed. Sometimes we don't sing long enough for the burnt offering to reach all the way up to heaven. Sometimes we got to all come together. Somebody's burning, somebody's offering, somebody's trumpeting, somebody's singing, somebody's bowing, somebody's worship. But that crescendo together sings a, not only releases a sound and a sight, but a smell to heaven, which catches God's attention. It's so, it's so intriguing that he calls the Levites lead worship. And I would say to you that a sacrifice without worship is really no sacrifice at all. If you're making sacrifices to God out of a religious spirit, out of, out of a have-to attitude, I don't know how far that sacrifice goes. But in this season, if you can make a sacrifice and at the same time praise God for his goodness and his glory, I believe that reaches up into heaven. I believe that there is a song that needs to be written in this season, 2020. There's a praise that needs to be made in this season, 2020. We're not going to wait till heaven. We're going to do it right here, right now. We're going to make a sacrifice while we lift up our praise, and the two will go up together, and the Lord will see our hearts and see our obedience, and he will respond. He calls the Levites to lead us into worship. Wow. There's a sacrifice you can make today in this pandemic you'll never have the chance to make again. I don't want to miss the opportunity to praise God in this season. I don't want to miss the opportunity to look at the worst the devil's, the worst year that the devil's ever thrown, that I've ever seen in my lifetime, and yet say, devil, that's some bad stuff, but my God reigns. Oh, praise the Lord who rules over all, who was and is and who will be. That, that This is a moment for the church to sing and declare God's wonders. It's amazing that one of the things, the most, one of the most infectious things we can do with the COVID-19 is to sing together corporately in an enclosed area. And so that's one of the reasons to be responsible. We've moved outside and we're six feet apart in little circles. We've moved outside, but we cannot be silenced any longer. We must sing our songs together, praise the Lord, bring him worship, bow down, celebrate instruments, songs, voices. And this is a time for the crescendo of God's praise to reach to heaven and break the spirit of COVID-19 off of our nation. And then the last thing, let me read 31 through 36, and then we'll wrap up. It says, Then Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near 
bring sacrifice and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all who were of a willing heart brought burnt offerings. If you're not paying close attention, you'll miss, it, you'll miss what, this, what this verse says right here. So I'm, I'm, let me unpack it before I move on. Let me preach it before I finish reading. Can I do that for you? Hezekiah says, you have now consecrated yourself to the Lord. Come near and bring sacrifices and thanks offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly, the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings. And all who are of willing heart brought burnt offerings. Stay here for a second. What happened is the priests consecrated themselves and they consecrated the, the, the temple. And they did that by blood. They did that by blood sacrifice, sin offerings and burnt offerings. That's what the priests were doing. They consecrated themselves. They consecrated the temple. And, as a, and then they offered burnt offerings as the Levites and the priests offered their praise to God. The assembly, the people began to gather in by the leadership, the spiritual leadership, and begin to lift their praise up. And without even a sacrifice, Hezekiah says, the way the people consecrate themselves is through worship. The leaders make a sacrifice and then open the gates for worship. But when people come in the back door or in the backyard or in your backyard and they join in the worship, they don't even realize it. But as they're worshiping, they're being consecrated as a priesthood and they're automatically being, being purged because of the acts of the priest. God is releasing his mercy through the leadership. And as they begin to worship, they are consecrated. And then on the backside of their consecration, he says, now go ahead and you can offer your, your thank offerings and your burnt offerings. And there's some more offerings. And the number of burnt offerings that the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 lambs. All these were of a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers of Levites helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. Besides the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offering. There were drink offerings. There were burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people, for the thing came about suddenly. The thing came about suddenly. And the last point is he challenges the people to make their sacrifices. What an amazing story. King Hezekiah in the very first month of his reign says, I look at my people and the sons and daughters have been taken in captivity. Swords are against swords. Families are struggling. Nations keep ra raiding us. I am going to undo what King Ahaz has done. I'm going to, first of all, consecrate a priesthood and the Levites. I'm going to consecrate the temple. I'm going to reinstitute sin offerings and burnt offerings. We're going to bring corporate worship back together around the temple. As we do this, the people are going to join in. They'll consecrate themselves. And once they've consecrated themselves, they will be empowered to bring their, all, their own offerings. So what happens is praise and worship gives us the ability to make sacrifices. So I know folks sometimes like, I don't have any sacrifice left in me. If you find your praise, you can find your sacrifice. Praising God frees up your ability to be able to bring the sacrifice he wants you to give. If you can come in with a willingness to worship, he'll give you a willingness to obey. A willingness to worship will open up a willingness to obey. So the people start praising God. And as they do, Hezekiah is like, hey, why don't you go get, bring your own offerings? It was good that the king brought offerings. It was good that the priests and the Levites brought offerings. But you bring your own offering. What do you have to bring? And they brought thank offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings, drink offerings. They were trying to find every, they, they weren't being legalistic about, I'm going to do the bare minimum. No, they were like, well, what can I bring? What can I do? I'm so excited of what God's doing right now. They brought so many offerings that the priests couldn't keep up. They couldn't keep up with giving the offering. The priests were overloaded by the obedience of the people that they had to call on the Levites to come help them out because they hadn't got enough people consecrated. And they, they, they came together and they did it. And then it says, and the king and the people were glad because this thing happened suddenly. And, and truly, a move of God is not fulfilled until it gets all the way through the people. It's got to get all the way through the people. 
Why am I so excited about preaching this sermon? Because we're coming back in person, and there's, un- there, there's power in agreement. So we can, we can lay hands on one another. We can pray and come in agreement with other. We can come into unity with each other. So as we're coming back, we're getting ready to launch a comeback on the devil. And, and we're going to do that by, by consecrating ourselves, by, by finding the king and the priest in each one of us. We're going to do that by bringing sacrifices and offerings before the Lord. We're going to do that by finding a new move of God in praise and worship and singing together in unity and power. And, and, and when we sing outside, man, our neighbors could hear our voice. We're singing. We don't have to be restricted by anything. And let me tell you, we got a beautiful sanctuary here at New Covenant Church. But when you praise God outside, looking at these mountains and looking at these clouds in the sky, I swear you can see the cloud of witnesses just behind those clouds. It's the best sanctuary that there possibly is. And as we release praise and worship, individual people are going to find their unique offering, their unique sacrifice to give to God. And as we do that, the church is coming together to be filled by God's power, to advance his kingdom, to bring back the Lord Jesus. This is our finest moment. 2020, come on. I am so excited about what God is doing in the local church and what God is doing in you. I say this to you from time to time, New Covenant. I wouldn't want to be a part of any other church. I have confidence in the God in you. I've seen you make heroic moves. I've seen you walk by faith. And I want you to know the story's already been written. And when we get to heaven one day, the saints of old are going to ask the saints of new, how'd you do it? What happened? What was it like? So I can't wait to see what God's getting ready to do in the second half of 2020. I want to pray for us before I close this out. I want to say something to you. Um, I I was talking to one of our members, and they feel strongly that that in in this new move, that love is going to get poured out on our earth, and that God is going to save some of the most unlovable people. He's going to save those who have been marginalized. He's going to save people that do not feel like that God is love at all. And and this person said to me, Pastor, what are you going to do when God is not restricted, when love is not restricted, and he pours out a spirit, and people get saved and don't give up their sin yet? And I said to him, that's between them and the Lord. If the Lord wants to save somebody and give them grace for a season before they deal with their sin, who am I to stop that? What I'm preparing my heart for is not to be scandalized by the goodness of God, not to be scandalized by what's getting ready to happen as he pours out a spirit, to, to not prejudge how he can move and how he cannot move. That's not my job. My job is to find my face on the ground, worshiping him, praising him as his spirit is poured out and let him do as much good as he wants to do. So I'm going to pray for us. And if you're listening to this today and you do not know Jesus Christ, you don't know him as your savior, I'm telling you right now, he loves you, he cares about you, and he is after you. He is seeking you to have relationship with you. The rest of us, if we've been asleep, if we've been awake, if if we've been in a, a fog, I want to shake you awake. I just want to say, wake up. It's a new day. God's on the march. God's on the move. Things are happening in the spirit realm, and we're getting ready to advance. So, so co- come on, come together. Here, it's, it's time for us to move together. I want to pray that a spirit of overcoming victory would come on your life right now. So, Papa, I pray right now for anybody that doesn't know you, anybody who has a false idea about who you are, anybody who has never established a relationship with you, may they hear this message, may hope arise inside of their heart, and may they lean in to to establish a relationship with you. May they just, right now, if that's you, just give him permission to introduce himself to you. He'll do it uniquely. All you have to do is say, Jesus, if you're real, I give you permission to introduce yourself to me. And he'll do it in, in, in a unique way for you that he hasn't done for anybody else. And for the rest of us, I'm praying an overcoming spirit of victory, a spirit of faith, a spirit of hope, that would come upon us, that the joy of the Lord would be your strength and that we would arise and shine in a new day and the glory of the Lord would break forth like the dawn and would fill his earth with his goodness. And I just, I just speak life and freedom and victory over the church right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, before we dismiss, I just want to take a minute. If you're new to New Covenant Church, just go to newcovenantchurch.com. 
click on that connect button. Let us know you're new and we'll respond back to you within 24 hours. You can leave a prayer request with a phone number and one of our altar ministers would be glad to call you back. And, and then lastly, if you are interested in knowing Jesus, if you're willing to let him introduce yourself, if you'll just mention that on that connect button, we would be glad to give you a call and walk you through that and talk with you and connect with you. These are exciting days. It's a great day to be part of the body of Christ. Make sure you connect with the body of Christ. And let's get excited to see what God is going to do this fall when he's going to do this winter. God bless you guys. Can't wait to see you guys soon.